Well, hello and welcome to The Rock's online services. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Can you believe it? It's December already. What a great season we're entering, celebrating the birth of Jesus, and we have a great service in store for you today. And before we go into that, what I'd like for you to do is text The Rock to 88202. This is a way we stay in touch with all of our Rock family. If you could fill out that digital welcome card by texting The Rock to 88202, we would greatly appreciate it. And I want to give a big what's up, shout out, hello to all of our house churches. We're so glad that you're joining us. We're so excited for God's presence to come into your home as you connect with family and friends. We're so happy that you're joining us. And if you're interested in starting a house church, you can go to our website at gototherock.com and click on house churches. Or even if you want some information about what is a house church, we're passionate about reaching people in our community. Now as we go on to service, let's engage our hearts with the Lord as we worship today. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Jesus, 
lift our hands to you because you are worthy of all of our praise. And you've been given a name that's above every name. And your word says, until now, you've asked nothing in my name, but then you said, ask, and you would receive that our joy might be full. Oh, you're worthy. Not only did you humble yourself and, and come from heaven to earth, but on earth you suffered a cruel death not because of anything you did, but because how worthy you are to be our Savior, to be our Lord, to be our sacrifice. Yes. So Lord, all that we can do is open up our mouth and praise you. All that we can do is say thank you. All that we can do is honor you. Oh, the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Your praises shall continually be in my mouth. So Lord, no matter what it is that I'm going through, when I find myself on the mountaintop, or if I walk even through the valley of the shadow of death, you are still worthy to be praised. You're still worthy to be adored. Because Lord, there only have you promised me life and that more abundantly here on earth. But Lord, that you've made me a home in heaven. Oh, you told us not just to rejoice because the demons are subject to us, but rejoice because our name has been written in the book of life. So we come before you today rejoicing in you, thanking you and praising you. And yes, Lord, we cast all of our cares upon you. Why? Because you said that you care for us. So those who are in need of healing because of a sickness that's in your body, by the authority we have in the name of Jesus, we say be healed in Jesus' name. Those who are finding themselves in economic difficulties, Lord, we lift them up before you now and we declare that your word says that not only will you heal us of all of our diseases, your word also reminds us, Lord, that you will bless us in every way. So we receive that blessing right now. We thank you, Lord, those that have children that are wayward today. We call them home. Lord, let them respond to the name of Jesus. Let them respond to your love, grace, and mercy. Oh, we declare that your name is worthy. We declare that you've made us worthy to praise it. So we praise you, we thank you, and we adore you. Be lifted up today as we pray all this in Jesus' name and all of God's people. Can we just say amen? amen. And amen and amen. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy to be praised. Well, the Lord bless you. And at this time, not only do we want to praise the Lord with our uh, worship and our singing, but we also want to praise the Lord in the giving of our tithes and offerings. And you know, those of you that have seen The Rock or been at The Rock, you know that we are a tithing, but we're also a missions giving church. A tithe is nothing more than 10% of your income. And the thing that we want to show the Lord is that, Lord, if we are willing to trust you with the 90% that we have left, then to try to hold on to the 100% without you. 90% with you is more than 100% without you. And so we encourage you not only to uh, uh, trust the Lord, but to show that in the giving of tithes and of giving of offerings. We're also a missions giving church. That simply means that we believe that everybody who's a part of the rock, that we can give something to missions, even if it's the loose chains that we find on the ground or somewhere else. But if we would just commit to giving something to missions at least once a month, we believe that we're supporting the Great Commission, going to all the world. And not only do we want to preach the gospel, we want to make disciples. So we thank you for partnering with us. We thank you, those who are partnering in tithes and offerings have be believing what the Lord is saying, but also partnering with The Rock and, and, and our mission to build solid lives all over the world. We thank you for doing that. And we also thank you for those of you who have given of food and other things to help the poor, help those that are needy or those who are needy, we thank you for that as well. And there's a scripture that comes to mind. We're talking about honoring the Lord. It's in the book of Proverbs. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all of your increase. Then he says, if you would honor me, the Lord says, you can't beat me giving. So if you give to me, he says, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. 
Though some of you are probably saying, I don't have a barn. Well, a barn is where we store things. And I don't know about you, I got a whole lot of storage in my house, whether it's in the garage or in the closet or what have you. The Lord says that will overflow. They says your vats, hopefully we don't have any too many winemakers out there, but our vat is simply that that provide occupation. It was a major occupation during the time of Jesus. So he says that the Lord says that he will also cause the work that he's given to, un, unto us to overflow. So honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all of your increase. And then learn this, you can't beat the Lord giving. You give and it shall be given unto you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to not only honor you with the fruit of our lips, giving praise to your name, but to honor you with our substance as well. Receive these tithes, receive these offerings, multiply them, and not only bless the gift, but bless the giver as we play this, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving is now easier with the Rock app. You can download it in your app store by searching Go to the Rock. Once you're in the app, click Give at the bottom of the page. Select your house church, congregation, or general giving and complete your giving details. Of course, you can always mail in your offering or hand deliver it to our church offices. You can also give on our website, go to therock.com by clicking on Give. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing and helping us reach as many people as possible with God's love. There's a name who reigns without contention, whose power can't be questioned or contained. With humble faith, he rules the earth and heavens, his glory knows no measure or the frame. And it's bursting past the border. Father, we approach your precious word today with expectancy. We believe you're going to speak to us today, and we pray that it would be a timely word for each of us, that each of us would know exactly what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And let me tell you what's happening today. I have invited my friend and ministry partner, 
of many, many years now, Pastor Carl McCauley, to bring a word to us. And let me tell you, there aren't many people in this world that I would say have the spirituality and the maturity to speak into this situation that we're in right now. But I trust this man of God 100%. He has the, the heart of God, but he also has the acumen of uh, being a teacher, a minister, a student of the Word of God, and he knows what he's talking about. Let me tell you, and I've worked with him closely for all these years, and I believe that he is right on target with what God is saying. So I can't wait to hear what Pastor Carl's about to bring. Open up your heart and listen to this servant of the Lord. And before we do, hold up your Bible and let's say this together. Ready, go. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open up my heart today to, to hear, hear God, God speak, speak a word that will change my life forever. Well, God bless you. And just before we go into the word, there are a few announcements that I'd like to make. And the biggest one concerns our uh, Christmas candlelight video. Many of you know that I have a responsibility over our house churches, and we are really excited about being able to use this Christmas candlelight video within our house churches. My wife and I, we are already making plans. And you know, I know that we're in the midst of this COVID virus and we're in the purple state and all of that, but we've even found ways that we can sort of reach out and still say, stay consistent with the guidelines. We're using Zoom. And so I got my daughter who's in Philadelphia. We have somebody that's in Moreno Valley, somebody that's in Riverside and we're in Cerritos, but we're still able to worship. We're, we're still able to share. We're still able to come together. And we're excited about what this Christmas candlelight video, it's going to be released on December the 20th. And not only is it going to be released, we've already given it a title and the title is The Real Story of Christmas. We're looking at getting people, some who might know the Lord Jesus Christ, some who don't. And in a very relaxed, but a very impactful way, be able to present the Christmas story. And what our real hope is, is that there will be some people who may not know Jesus, who, who, or who may not be where they ought to be, but because they see how Jesus humbled himself and see all the way from Genesis and all the way to the end of the Bible, uh, what the story of Jesus is all about their hearts will be touched and their lives will be changed. I am encouraging you, be on the lookout for the release of this Christmas video, but not only be on the lookout for yourself, let your, friend, your family and friends and others that you know know about this. Help them to see how they can use it. Or you can simply watch it or you can uh, be a participant or you can actually do it yourself. Oh, there's some exciting things, but the most exciting things is, this is the Christmas story put in a modern way that other people could grab hold to who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ and still hear the story about Christmas. Well, remember the release date is December the 20th, and that's soon to come. Get planning for it now. My biggest fear is, is that we'll keep putting it off and putting it off, and before you know it, December 20th will be here and gone. We only have that window of opportunity. Let's be faithful to seize it and lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we're in between seasons, in between the Thanksgiving season and the Christmas season, and that's always, to me, a marvelous time of the year. People are all excited. They are expecting things. But we also know that in the midst of this wonderful time in the year, there are also some restrictions. There's, there's also some concerns. There's also some worry. Uh, there's a coronavirus. And, 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 but even beside that, there is this whole election and, and, and we're still not sure of the outcome. And, 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 and besides that, there is, seems to be um, discord and, and racial discord, social discord. And even beside that, there is something that's called global warming that some people are still worried about. There are a lot of things that are affecting us right now, but I believe that the Lord has a word for us. And I could find a word in the New Testament, but I love the Old Testament. The reason why I love it is because it has stories about real people 
people that I can identify with. So what I'd like to have you do is to turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis and chapter number 42, to the book of Genesis and chapter number 42. And I'd like to read verse number 36 in Genesis chapter 42. Uh, we are going to go to the New Testament, and I love Pastor Jerry Dumby tells us to turn to two places in the Bible. I do have two hands, but we're only going to read one place at one time. So let's go first to Genesis chapter number 42 and verse number 36. And in Genesis chapter 42 and verse number 36, it says, And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. And that's where we live today. We can turn to a lot of things that are against us. This pandemic being one. We don't know what to expect day, to, day by day. A restaurant is open one day, it's closed another day. We're told we can meet, we're told that we can't meet. Not only is it a pandemic, but I mentioned before, the election uncertainties. We just don't know what to think. We don't know who to believe. There are reputable people, people that I have a lot of, of confidence in, and they're saying one thing, and other people that I have confidence in as well, they're saying the very opposite. And Lord, here am I in the middle. All these things are against me. And the biggest thing is the division that is happening in our nation. I lived through the 60s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but I've never seen division quite this bad. And these are good people, and we can't agree. All these things are against me. And if I'm not careful, I'll be like Jacob was and find myself falling into despair. It's one thing after another thing after another thing, and Lord, where can I find an anchor for my soul? Where can I find help? One of the reasons why I love the Old Testament is because of what it says in the New Testament about the Old Testament. One of those places is in Romans 15:4. If you know me, I quote this scripture all the time. Uh, the New King James, it says, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, that we through patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So he says, those things that were written, remember now, when the New Testament was being written, the Old Testament uh, uh, was the only Bible that they had. So when Romans was being written, when Paul referred to things written beforehand, he was referring to the Old Testament. I love what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, both the old and the new, is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly furnished, another place says thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that means that when we take a look at the, our scripture in Genesis uh, chapter 42, that too was written for our learning. And here's a man who's faced with difficulties. The book of Genesis, I, I love it and I, I teach it many times and when I do, I always like to point out, you know, there is a simple outline for the book of Genesis. I simply call it, it talks about events and talks about people. Genesis chapter 1 to chapter number 11 is about events. It's about the creation. It's about the fall. It's about the flood. It's about the Tower of Babel. Now, there are people that are mentioned, but the primary subject is the events that take place, cataclysmic events. But then in Genesis chapter number 12, things begin to change. And more than half of the book, two-thirds of the book, is not about events. It's about people. It's about Abraham his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and his son Joseph. And that's what our scripture text is. Jacob is speaking to his sons. His sons have just come from Egypt because of this great famine that was in the land at that time. 
and they came back with a report and says, there was a man that we met who was in charge of things within Egypt and, 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 and he was a little rough, but, 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 but he was also kind to us in, 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 in a sense that uh, not only was he asking us about our family and sort of challenging us about that, but when we came back, we found that all the money that we gave him for the food, all that money had been returned to us. But he made it perfectly clear, don't come back without that the youngest son or the, or the youngest brother that you have, the one that you talked to me about, whose name was Benjamin. Because if you bring him back, then I'll know that you've been telling me the truth. If you don't, don't come back. So here they are, they're relating this to their father. Now we all know Joseph. Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. But he was a very special son. What made him special was that he was born to Rachel. Oh, when Jacob was married, he, was, had, he had desired to marry Rachel. And I don't know how this happened. But he wound up not marrying Rachel, but marrying her sister. I say I don't know how this happened because he discovered that it was a wrong woman when he consummated the marriage. I don't think I could ever explain that to my wife. But he found that he had married the wrong person. And as a result of that, there was tension in his home. He finally did bring Rachel in as his bride. So he has Leah or Leah, Rachel's sister, Rachel. And then each of them have maid servants. And so he had a house where all four of these women bore him children. If you want to hear about a dysfunctional family, read about Jacob and his family. They were a dysfunctional family. Wait, 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 wait. Don't criticize them because if God could use that dysfunctional family, then there's hope for you and I. Because some of our families are dysfunctional, but God doesn't give up on them. He can still give us promises that are exceeding great and precious. And by these promises, we'll be partakers of a divine nature, it says in 2 Peter. Just like what happened to Jacob and his family is the same thing that can happen to us and our families. God can still do something miraculous like we did for Jacob. But Jacob is distraught. I mean, here it is, is that all of a sudden he's here, there, his sons are coming back, but they're letting him know that they cannot come back and get food another time without sending their youngest brother, Benjamin. He says, you don't understand how depressed I am. I remember Joseph, the son that I loved, and he's no more. And you didn't come back with Simeon. You said that this overseer, he required some surety that you would bring your younger brother, so you left him there. And that's grieving me. And then you're telling me that when you go back, you're going to have to take Benjamin. Am I going to lose him too? See, Joseph represented the past. And we all have some past hurts. Simeon represented the present. We all have some present hurts. And sometimes we even borrow on the future. And when we begin to look at the future, we begin to see the future in a way that that hurts us too. That's where Jacob was. He could remember Joseph. I sent him to go and find you guys. And when you came back, you came back with, a, with that coat I gave him and it was covered with blood. And all that we could suppose was that Joseph must have been killed. Well, the beautiful thing about that is that Joseph wasn't killed. His brothers knew what had happened to him they'd sold them into slavery. You see, if I was going to entitle this message, I would title it all these things. 
See, Jacob said this way, all these things are against me. But I would title the message, all these things, and then I would put dot, dot, dot. Because that's where we live. All these things that Jacob talked about, maybe not exactly, but in some way, shape, or form, all these things happen to us. But the question is, what will we say about these things? Jacob said, all these things are against me. But is that what we will say? Is that what the Bible teaches us to say? Is it that all these things are against us? Or is it what it says in Romans 8, 28? And we know that all things work together for good. Not just all these things, all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. All things. And I love reading the book of uh, uh, Genesis and there's some little things that are mentioned and sometimes if you read it too fast, you just read right over it. And one of those things is, is simply found in Genesis chapter number 37 and verse 22. I think we all know the story of, of uh, uh, Joseph and how his brothers, when, he, when, they, uh, when uh, Joseph came to find his brothers to return word to his father that his brothers were okay because they had been gone too long tending the sheep and his, the dad wanted to know where they were, so he sent Joseph to find out. When Joseph was coming toward them, they looked at him and said, here comes that dreamer, and they literally talked about killing their brother. But the interesting thing is that the youngest or the oldest brother, Reuben, he said something in Genesis chapter number 37. They wanted to kill their brother, but Reuben persuaded them not to kill their brother, but to cast him into a pit. And I want to show something, which I think is very important. In Genesis 37 and verse number 22, it says, and Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Remember now, they talked about killing Joseph. But cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. Well, that doesn't sound too thrilling. Don't kill him, but throw him into a pit and just let him sort of die in isolation, slowly, rather than killing him and having him die instantly. But that's not what Reuben had in mind. Look at what he said again in Genesis 37, the rest of verse 22. And do not lay a hand on him, listen to this, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Let me share it to you another way. If God could not figure out how to deliver Joseph, Reuben just gave him a way that he could deliver Joseph. But he doesn't Take that avenue. My point is this. There are things that we go through. And many a times we're looking for deliverance a certain way. And sometimes deliverance doesn't come that way. It's not because God cannot. But in Joseph's case, he had a bigger and a better plan. One that would not only deliver Joseph, but would deliver his family. One that would cause the promise that he made to Abraham to be fulfilled. And in our lives, there are times when we look for a deliverance a certain way. We say, Lord, you could always do this. Just do that. That's all I need. And the Lord doesn't do that because he has something bigger and better in mind to do for you, to do for me, to do for us. But Jacob looked at that and said, it is something that I should despair over. He thought his son Joseph was dead. There are things in our life that we think are dead. And the Lord says, it's not dead. It's been temporarily put on hold. I know where it is. I know how to revive it. I know what to do with it. But will you believe me? Will you wait on me? 
Will you let me get all the pieces in place? Because I could say like Jacob and all these things are against me. Or I could say like the Apostle Paul both said in the book of Romans, all these things work together for my good. Well, not only did Jacob look at the things that were going on within his life and said, all these things are against me. Jacob believed that he had the whole story. Given what he could see, this is what I see. My son Joseph is dead and now they've taken my son Simeon and they're talking about taking my son, uh, the youngest, Benjamin. All these things are against me. But what he failed to realize is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But how do I see what's not seen? He's not talking about seeing with my eyes. I see with my heart of faith. And what my heart of faith has to look at is what does the word say? You see, even in life, sometimes things happen. And it is difficult for me to explain uh, why this would happen, why this difficulty would happen. But Jesus helps me out. He said, you get excited because the demons are subject unto you. But that's not what to get excited about. You want to get excited because your name is written within the book of life. In other words, this life that I live, no matter how good it is, it is only temporary. And compared to eternity, it's not even a fraction of an inch on a 10,000 mile ruler. It's just a speck. And when I reach eternity, I'll see just how small of a speck it is. But because I live in this time and age, I'm focusing all my attention on this life. I'm fa focusing all my attention on this body. But guess what? This body is going to go back to the dust from which it came. But there's a spirit man, there's a soul man inside of me that has a destiny that is eternal. And what God is interested in is making that man ready, getting that prepared. Oh, when, when you see a car accident or something, uh, am I as concerned about the body of the car and what damage that has, that the body of the car has sustained? Or am I more concerned about the people in the car? And that's what the Lord says about us. And because this is all we know, it's hard for us to see it the way that he sees it. But he's letting us know your focus on that, which is only going to survive for a short amount of time. And once you get to eternity, you'll be so glad that I focused on that, which was going to be eternal. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 12, it says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now being the life that we live now, and then being the life that we're going to have when we see Jesus face to face. He goes on to say, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Back in those days when they talked about mirrors, they weren't mirrors like we have today because for the most part, I could look at a mirror and I could truly see myself. But back in those days, they would take a, a metal and they would polish the metal really well. And they would look and, and see something, a, a reflection, some image in that uh, 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 a metal. But what they saw, it was a likeness. There was something there, but if you had food between your teeth, you wouldn't be able to see it looking at that metal. So he says, you're looking at life 
as if you're looking in a mirror, those old fashioned mirrors, and you see something, but you don't see all the details. You don't see all of the things. So he says, look, I'm going to let you know what to expect. And this is what he says in letting us know what to expect. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart that each one's praise will come from God. In other words, there are some things that I cannot see. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. There are things that I will never know. But God has given me his word that I might know his heart, that I might know that I can trust him, that I might know when I look at things and things look so bad, that doesn't mean they're really that way because I could be looking at the backside of a quilt that he has woven together. And when I get on the other side, I can see the design that he's intricately making within my life. That's where Jacob was. He was on the backside of that quilt and all he saw was Joseph wasn't there, Simeon wasn't there, and they're now talking about taking my Benjamin. But were all those things against him? No. Why did the Lord record those things? He told us in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written beforehand was written for our learning. He recorded those things, not that we would act like, Joseph, like Jacob act, but that we can learn from Jacob. We can learn that when things look like they are terrible, when they look like everything is falling down around me, that does not mean that God cannot do the impossible because with man, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And he wants to show us that. He wants to show us that he can open up doors that no man can shut. He can make ways where there seems to be no way. And he says, they lived it out that you could learn from them and you could walk in a place that maybe they could not walk in because they didn't have the revelation that you have. I love what David said, I would have fainted in Psalms 27 unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. All these things and Jacob said, are against me. But we see all these things. And in my title, I'm going to put dot, 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 because we have to fill in what we believe about all these things. Remember Elisha? Elisha had a servant and the Lord was giving unto Elisha these words of knowledge. And he was then giving the words of knowledge to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel then was, was able to defeat the king of Syria. And the king of Syria says, how is it that he looks like he's always a step ahead of me? He knows where I'm going before I get there. It's like he's, he's, he's listening to my conversations that I have in secret. And then someone said, he is. There's a prophet that somehow, we don't know how, but he's able to listen into what you're saying. He said, what's the name of that prophet? Elisha. Well, let's go down there and let's take him out. So the Assyrian army came to Elisha and surrounded him. Elijah, it looks like Elisha was asleep and his servant got up and sort of got out there and stretched and looked out there. And all of a sudden he saw, it looks like the whole Syrian army had surrounded them. And he says, Elisha, I got some bad news because I've looked outside and we're surrounded by the Syrian army. But you remember what Elisha said. He, he said, without even going out there, those that are for us are more than those who be against us. And I can see that servant looking around and saying, well, you must see some things that I don't see because I just went out there and looked out that window and I'm saying, I don't see anybody for us. All them guys out there are against us. Then Elisha prayed. And this is our prayer. Lord, open my eyes, not my physical eyes, but Lord, open the eyes of my spirit. Isn't that what it says in the book of Ephesians? That, they, that he would give me a, a revelation, the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened, that I might know what the hope of my calling is. Lord, open my eyes 
that I can see what you see. Because you told David that you don't see as man sees because man looks at the outward appearance, but you look at the heart of the matter. And Lord, if you don't show it to me, at least give me this revelation that everything is all right in your hands. And many a times that's where I had to get to because I couldn't see how this was going to work out. I couldn't see how we were going to make it. I couldn't see how this friendship or, or this opposition was going to be handled. There was no way that I could see it being handled. But I learned that God has ways that I don't know. He has people to use like Reuben that I don't know. And he says, I don't even have to use Reuben. I have ways you have not seen that I can work it out. As he did in the life of Joseph, in the life of Jacob. Joseph, even though he was thrown into prison, had no recourse to the judicial system within Egypt. He interprets some dreams of a butler and a baker. And next thing you see, he is exalted to be second only under Pharaoh. But there's something about that even. The Bible points out that he interpreted the butler's dreams. And it, 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 it happened uh, uh, when, when the butler was thrown into prison. It, it, it was on the day that was a, a Pharaoh's birthday. And that particular birthday feast caused Pharaoh to get upset with the butler and the baker and he threw them both into prison. Uh, Joseph interpreted both dreams. And then he said something to the butler who he gave a good prophecy or interpretation to. He said, when you get out, remember me. See, I love the little detail. Uh, the Bible points out that this was on Pharaoh's birthday. And, 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 and so that means that the next year, uh, Pharaoh was going to have a birthday at that same time. The butler forgot Jacob or forgot Joseph. But you would assume that when that birthday came around and he's remembering the things that happened to him, he would remember Joseph, but he didn't remember Joseph. Because the Lord wanted to point something out. I don't need anyone to do what I want to do in your life. I can do it all myself. So the butler didn't remember Joseph until the Lord tapped him on the shoulder and said, now the time is right. Because you see, Joseph, all you want to do is to get out of prison. I got something that is bigger and better than that. I want you to be the savior of your people because this famine is not just for a short period of time. When Jacob says all these things are against me, it's the second year of the famine. And Joseph says, you ain't seen nothing yet. You got five more years to go. But because of what God has done, you can find a safe haven with me within Egypt. So the first thing is, when you hear the words, all these things, what do you put on the end of it? Are you like Jacob? And will you put are against me? Or when you hear these words, all these things, you quickly run to the book of Romans in 828 and says, all these things work together for good. I sometimes like to tell the story that I have a, a, a daughter-in-law and this daughter-in-law is a great baker. She can really bake some whatever, cookies, cakes, pastry, whatever. She just does a great job. But I remember when I was a kid, uh, back in the days when I was a kid, everything was homemade. Didn't have any uh, cake mix or something. You just had to take the flour and the eggs and the yeast and whatever you used. I guess you can see I'm not good as a, no, I'm not a very good baker. But I remember that my mom would allow us to taste the ingredients. And I loved the dough. Once she whipped everything in there and got that dough and I would put my finger in there and, and eat a little bit. Maybe it wasn't sanitary, but anyway, that's what I would do. But I also remember this. Not every ingredient 
was good by itself. I've never sat down to a table full of flour and just started eating the flour. I like butter on bread, but I've never just got a piece of butter and just start eating the piece of butter. Now, maybe the milk, I can drink it all by itself. My point is this. They're all different types of ingredients. And what the Lord is saying, I can take all those ingredients. I can mix them together, put just the right amount of heat in for just the right amount of time and bring something out better than any of the ingredients by themselves. And that's what he was trying to help Jacob to see. That all these things were not really against you. They were just ingredients that I can get into my hands and mix them together and bring something good out of them. I'm saying that because there are ingredients that are in this world today that when I look at those ingredients, I don't see how we can have anything good come out of all of this, out of all the hatred, out of all of the uh, uh, finger pointing, out, out of all of the language of, of just opposition and aggression. But I look to the Lord from whence comes my help. And I declare what the Bible says, my help comes from the Lord. Can he do it? He's the maker of heaven and earth. He can do it. But we were his people. He to cry out for him to do it. But there's something else we started. I need to be careful that I don't try to figure it out with the limited understanding that I have. And that's what Jacob was doing. He was leading to his own understanding, forgetting how limited that was. And you know, Proverbs chapter three, verses uh, five through seven, I guess. This is my life verse. Proverbs three and five says, trust in the Lord with all, with all, with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Instead, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It's so easy for me to lean on my understanding understanding about the things that are happening within this nation. It is remarkable to me how much everyone knows about what's going on and nobody was there. And even if I was there, I'm still not sure I know what's going on. And I'm not saying that this one is telling the truth or this one is lying. I just don't know. But I do know this. I don't have to lean on my own understanding but I can just acknowledge the Lord and says, Lord, I don't want to judge anything before it's time. I don't want to look at anything and, 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 and put my imprint on it. Instead, I want to see and hear what you're saying, realizing that you may not tell me everything all at once, but all that I need to know is what I need to do now. And I found that we serve a faithful God he will show us that. And he gives that to us in a promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. I love this because in the Old Testament, Genesis 22, it says that God did tempt Abraham and, or Abraham and asked him to go and offer up his son, his only son, as a burnt offering. This is when uh, 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 Abraham took Isaac and put him on the altar and, and he was getting ready to sacrifice him. But I, I love that that word tempt. God tempt Abraham. How did he tempt him? The word tempt can mean to tempt for evil. It could also mean to test. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 13, in the New Testament now, it says no temptation, no test or trial. And sometimes these tests and trials could be to prove something like a piece of metal to be as good as we think it is, or a test or trial could be something that the devil uses in order to tear someone down. But the Lord says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So in other words, no matter what it is that we're going through, as difficult or hard as it might be, 
It's common to man. Other people go through it. But the emphasis is not that. There you, all of us are going to have tests. Jesus says, in the world you have tribulation, but he says, but, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It says, no, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Here it is, but God. Hallelujah. But God. But God is faithful. And what's he faithful to do? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I remember when I used to do athletics, uh, basketball and football, a little bit of football, ran track. And at the beginning of the season, you had to do some exercises, run laps. And it was, you were always taught that when you got to the point that you didn't think you could go anymore, Go just a little bit more. The coach believed that he knew how much we can go. Now, sometimes I argued with my coach. I said, wait a minute. My body is telling me it can't go anymore. And the coach says, Carl, get out there. But let, let me tell you again, my body, but he had more insight into my body than I did. Because sure enough, I could go one more. And every time I went the limit, I didn't realize that I was building myself up. So here, the Lord knows just how much we can take. But not only does he know how much we can take, he's also regulating what the trial or the test is. So he says, uh, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not, who will not, who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There's two things here. The Lord promises he won't allow us to be tempted or tested beyond what we're able. But he also says he'll make a way of escape. And sometimes what I need to do is to keep my eyes open for the way that the Lord wants me to go, for that way of escape that he's designed, that I'll be able to stand every test that comes my way, because not because I'm so faithful, but because God is faithful. So when I hear those words, all these things, what do I put in there? Do I say all these things, or they have come against me, or do I say all these things work together for good? When I begin to look at what I know, do I say that I know it all? Or do I say I am only looking through those old fashioned mirrors and seeing dimly? But there's one who sees the end from the beginning, and that is our God. Do I say I should lean on my understanding? Well, or do I say I should not lean on my understanding and said in all my ways, I will just acknowledge him. What do you say? This week, previous weeks, we've all faced the same thing. There have been difficulties and trials, things that have been unfortunate. I've had loved ones that I know of in my family that have been stricken with the coronavirus and almost died. I've even had some who have died. What will you say? The devil says, where was your God? And I say, he's still on the throne. I only see in part, I only see through a mirror dimly. I only know in part, but the part that I know is my God is faithful. The part that I know 
is that my God is good. That part that I know is he works all things together for good. Every time I read in scripture and see what the Lord has done, it's always been good. He's always delivered. Wait, 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 what about that uh, uh, rich man in Lazarus? Uh, uh, Lazarus died, laid at the door of a rich man, hoping that the rich man would give him something and the rich man gave him nothing. Where was your God then? My God was trying to save a rich man who was destined for hell. But he gave him one more opportunity. He took someone who in his poverty was headed to heaven, had him sit at the gate to provide an opportunity for that rich man to have his heart moved with compassion. Compassion that would allow the Lord to come in and introduce him to salvation, but he refused. I think that maybe Lazarus didn't like what he endured when he was on earth. But when he got to Abraham's bosom and saw the fate of the rich man and saw his fate, he remembered the words that Jesus spoke, which says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? I may not be able to answer every question, but hear what I'm telling you. Those questions that I've had, that I put before the Lord, most he's answered. And the ones that he hasn't, he's just telling me to hold in there. I'll show you that I do all things there's no other place to be but in the hands of our God. There might be some people who are listening to this and you may not know the Lord. I'm here to let you know there was one time I didn't know the Lord. Didn't even think that I needed him. I would argue that if some of the people that I know, if they're going to heaven, I'm going to heaven too because I do just as good as they do. I mess up just as much as they mess up. I didn't realize that my ticket to heaven wasn't based upon my righteousness. It was based upon who I knew, who I put my trust and faith in. And they might have been messing up just like I was, but they had their faith and trust in Jesus. And if they ask forgiveness of their sins, they receive that forgiveness so they can make heaven their home. But until I made that decision, I couldn't make heaven my home. I used to like science and math and I remember talking about how practical and how uh, uh, rational I was. So all of a sudden, the Lord began to put an equation on my mind. But Carl, if, if you are correct and there is no heaven, what's the probability of that? Well, since I wasn't, wasn't certain about anything, the probability that there is no heaven is, let's make it 0.99999, as many nines as you want to go. And if there's no heaven, uh, 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 what's the uh, 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 consequence? What's the best day that you've lived? Put any kind of number you want to put on the best day you've lived. And the way you decide things is you just simply take the probability of it, multiply it by the consequence of it, and then you weigh that against something else to decide what it is that you want to do. I know I was strange. I like Dr. Spock. So I, my wife can tell you that I was strange. So let's go the other way. Let's say that the probability that there's a heaven and a hell is really small, so make it as small as you want to make it, but what's the consequence? If the Bible is true, and if I have not reconciled my life to Jesus Christ, I will spend eternity in hell. Tell me something you know about math. A finite number times an infinite number, what's the result? Infinity. Two finite numbers multiplied together, what's the result? A finite number. Which one is greater? It behooves you to make sure you're certain about eternity. 
And as I began to seek the Lord, he began to reveal himself to me. So maybe you're out there. You do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know that he's calling you today to at least direct your attention to him and let him show himself to you. And those of you that know that you need to receive Jesus as your savior, there's no better time to receive him than right now. So can we all simply just bow our heads wherever you might be? I'm not going to make you do something that's grandiose because the Lord doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks to the heart. And can you just repeat after me? If you want to make the Lord Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord, or if you just want to say, I don't know, and I want to know, so I want you to show me who you are. I want to pray for both of you. Can you just repeat after me? Dear Lord, for those who are saying in their hearts that they don't know, there is so much confusion in this world. There's truth being spouted everywhere and it's opposite. But Lord, we know that you can make yourself real. You sent your son Jesus to make you real here on earth. Now those who don't know you, repeat after me. Lord, show yourself to me. Take my limited understanding. Take my doubts and fears. And through it all, reveal yourself to me. And for those of you whom the Lord has revealed himself, and you want to receive him as your Savior and Lord, also repeat after me. Dear Lord, I repent of my sins. I come to you asking you to forgive me of my sins and to make me a member of your family. Fill me with your spirit. Be the one who guides me and teaches me and leads me. Lord, help me to be able to tell others about what you're doing in me as I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This time of year is a year where there are so many hearts that are tender, tender toward the things of God tender toward even the spirit of Christmas where one another, where we give to one another, we open ourselves up to one another. Jesus came and says to us, go into all the nations or make disciples of all the nations. And during this time of year, let's not miss this opportunity because there are so many people who at least want to turn in the direction of Jesus. The enemy's there to turn them back. But when they turn into in the direction of Jesus, let us be open to lead them to a greater understanding as to who he is. To lead them as someone led us into a saving knowledge. One way that we can do this is with our Christmas video that will be coming out on the 20th. I encourage you one of our most populated, I guess that's the term to use, most attended service was our candlelight video. And so now we're gonna put it, or our candlelight service, now we're gonna put that on video. And I pray that you would join me and my wife as we use that tool to not only encourage our hearts, but to help other people to see what it is that we have seen when we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He humbled himself and became a man. As a man, he gave his life. There's no greater treasure than what Jesus has paid for us.
I just want to thank you all for watching this, being here today. And I pray that the Lord will meet you where you are and that he would show himself strong on your behalf, that you would realize there's no greater savior to have but Jesus. Receive us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Wow, what a great and powerful word. I know one takeaway I'm taking away from this was all these things, are they, are they all coming against me or is God working out all things together for my good? I know that I can be comforted even in 2020 that God is working out all things together for my good. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to download our church's app. It's the way for you to stay connected with us. It's right there on your phone. Uh, you can get access to our daily words, our daily messages, information about what's going on in our church. And so if you go to your app store and search Go to the Rock, all one word, that's search Go to the Rock, all one word. You can download it. It's free, and we want it to be a blessing to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week.